Hey everybody, my name is Rachel. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm here today in New York City with other organizers in the PSL, Amanda and Lillian, uh, to have a little chat for Women's History Month. Happy Women's History Month. Um, I think it's important if we're gonna celebrate and honor women to talk about how we're doing as women. Around the country, around the globe, things are kind of tough for women right now. A lot of women might say that, you know, we're not doing that great. Between a genocide happening in Palestine and uh, the conditions here in the United States with abortion being rolled back, the cost of living, housing, uh, food, etc., things are a little bit rough. So it's Women's History Month. Are we celebrating or are we grieving? What, what are we doing right now? <laughs> I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Uh, people are doing all different things in Women's History Month. Some are just buying their feminist mugs and putting them out on the desk for the month. But uh, I, I mean, it's not a good time for women, a lot of women right now. I mean, we're mm -hmm. literally living through a genocide right now. Mm -hmm. The first in history that you can see play out literally on your cell phone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, how do you watch that happen? 70% of the people who uh, are dying in Palestine are women and children. We're literally seeing that. It's Women's Month. That hasn't stopped, right? And then you look around at the conditions here, which like it's 2024 and things are going backwards for mm -hmm. women in this country which is like the wealthiest country in the world. So I don't know, I feel a little conflicted in Women's Month. Like, yeah, we, big questions are coming up. Like what, what do we as women need to be doing right now? Or women who care about the futures of women, the autonomy of women, the well-being of women, like it's not good. And you look around at like the conferences and the celebrations uh, of Women's Month and it just feels so hollow to me if it's not about these questions. If it's not about Palestine, honestly, during Women's Month, I'm just not interested this year. Like Period. there's literally a genocide. I think that there's, to me, this is like why, you know, I, <laughs> I actually am like a little embarrassed to admit it, but like I, I, I didn't really like identify as a feminist mm -hmm. before being like a, a real fighting socialist because like it doesn't hit for me if it's just about like, I don't know if it's not about like how women are actually doing right, right and you know especially as an American like I can't talk about feminism without talking about like what our country is doing and not doing for the women that I see every day and the women that I know are right. are living you know the consequences yeah. of our government around the world that's right. what I want to talk about in women's month right I think the point you're making is really important because how, what what discrepancy is there that allows for some people to be over here having their little like girl boss mug conference feel good moment when there's a genocide happening over here and there's women who are fighting on the ground tooth and nail here around the world in Palestine against that genocide. It's just two different realities. And I think it's rooted in the fact that uh, there's different types of feminisms, different types of fights for women's liberation that are quote unquote women's liberation in some cases that are happening. And I think it, we, maybe we should start by defining a little bit of what that that looks like. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how you mentioned that you didn't identify as a feminist for a long time because what's often presented as feminism to us doesn't really resonate with us, right? Um, mm -hmm. What is often presented to us as feminism is what we would consider a bourgeois type of feminism, which okay. is basically mm -hmm. like feminism that defines wom a woman as having the same types of interests across like class, race, nationality, or history, like irrespective of history, right? Mm -hmm. And it's this uh, feminism that's really concerned about like advancing up the corporate ladder mm -hmm. or you know making sure women hold uh, positions of political power that were represented in Washington. But, you know, that type of feminism, it makes a lot of assumptions about women, right? It assumes that all women are, like, first of all, U.S. citizens, that they're college educated, that they're financially stable, financially independent, which doesn't really speak to a lot of women in the U.S., mm -mm. right? Um, what financially kind of independent that alone <laughs> it's like who is financially independent well, right it doesn't recognize like the economic rights of women if i'm living in the most expensive city in the world and i'm struggling to pay for rent i'm struggling to pay for groceries i can't afford health care what good is a type of feminism 
that is largely focused on rising up the corporate ladder or mm-hmm. like making sure that women are sitting in boardrooms, right? How can I possibly identify with these feminist icons that they push, like Sheryl Sandberg, um, <laughs> Kirsten Gillibrand, Nancy Pelosi? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just a, a bourgeois feminism is just a type of feminism that doesn't really recognize the ra- the race and class dynamic. Mm-hmm. It kind of sees patriarchy as like maybe the primary contradiction. It sees like men as oppressors of women. It sees men as holding us back. It sees the fact that we're not properly represented in corporate boardrooms as holding us back. But it doesn't really seek to overthrow that like gender dynamic. It seeks to elevate women to the same levels of power as men so that they can be oppressors too. I mean, it's interesting the way that you talk about how like bourgeois feminism is assuming that so much is already accounted for with like the women that it's concerning itself with these like, I don't know who these women are. I mean, I guess I do. They're women who are like really doing well off who are not like the majority to assume that like women are living in peace, that they are like fundamentally physically safe, that they are economically like doing all right. These are big assumptions that actually don't speak to huge portions of the women on this planet for me didn't associate that with like really caring about women that seemed like some abstract thing that didn't have a lot of relevance and I feel like that's kind of what bothers me this women's month about like some of the celebrations that I'm seeing like they're just not about like the most pressing issues that are facing Mm -hmm. a lot of women right now Mm -hmm. I think the point you're getting to also speaks to the need for a, a working class feminism because the majority of us have to work to survive in this country if we don't get up and go to work we don't make a paycheck we're not gonna have a roof over our head and that's not the type of feminism that we're getting from the Hillary Clintons and the Kamala Harris's who are just saying do it you know because there's a lot of complicating factors that make it difficult for us to get anywhere you know to be able to you know, move forward. And I think we should go back to the point of what's happening in Palestine right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And the role that women in the United States are playing both to fight it and to perpetuate it, which is really important, right? Because, (laughs) you know, it's our tax dollars that are funding a genocide in Palestine right now, instead of funding our schools, instead of funding healthcare, affordable housing, Anything, like anything that would be useful, you know? Um, and it's women who are in power who are defending the sending of our money to kill and bomb women and children in schools, in hospitals, in Palestine. And it's, I think it's really important for us, as you mentioned, Lillian, in Women's History Month, to have all of our conversations about women centered around what's happening in in Palestine and other places that are being ambushed by U.S. led and funded war and occupation and imperialism straight up. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned the way that, you know, a lot of women are actually using feminism as a justification for war in Gaza. It's a pretty regular occurrence. And I remember like right after the September 11th attacks, this kind of bourgeois feminism was really mobilized to uh, invade countries like Iraq, invade countries Mm. like Afghanistan. At the time, then First Lady Laura Bush, you know, she called the war on terror a fight for the dignity of all women. And she was talking about the content in the context of Afghanistan. (laughs) And, you know, that's delusional. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And it was not only her, Caroline Maloney, who was at the time in the House of Representatives from New York, she got up in front of the house and she was wearing a burqa. And she was talking about, you know, like how oppressed women in Afghanistan were and how we needed to invade Afghanistan to like overthrow the Taliban and like free women from this oppressive like society. And it's really interesting because the way that they present colonized women, they present them in a very unfeminist manner, right? They always see colonized women as just waiting in need of Western intervention. Uh Like Uh they need Mm. a U.S. invasion Uh to overthrow their government so that they can finally attain their rights. 
that's just not reality. If you look at what happens to women during wars and occupation, yeah. it drives back any sort of standard of living. It destroys schools. It destroys hospitals. Any sort of economic development is just like pulled backwards. Well, yeah, and I want to like talk about Afghanistan and Iraq, which are like the the primo examples of wars that the United States weaponized, like the plight of women to justify and, and win popular support for their invasions. But it's like not only did their interventions destroy the quality of life for women right. and then not put it back, of course, like because no. why would they, they do that? And they're not going to. <laughs> but also like. They're the ones who set up the conditions, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. There had been so much progress that women had participated in, that they had actually been determining like what their society was going to look like. They had like been building schools, building really good school systems. The Iraqi school system was like, I, I mean, it was receiving people, women, students from all over the world. There was like a hundred percent literacy rate in Afghanistan. You're talking about a society where you know people were actually like moving forward their quality of lives building their educational system like right. women were were participating in the workforce and you know having political rights and they were part of that progress and then the United States why does the United States target this because you know they do things like nationalize their their oil reserves and you know what that means is like that basically countries are saying that the oil in our country uh, actually if it's owned by all these foreign powers that we actually don't think that it should be going to the U.S. and going to Britain right. and going to France and whatever, that it should actually be used here to fund programs like our educational system, to fund health clinics, to fund whatever. That's not OK with the United States. They want right. to keep those resources. They want to keep that, you know, domination over these regions. They don't care about what happens to the people. They want to get that resources get the dom get the domination back and so they just have these wars of regime change they have their sanctions regimes they invade all of the different ways that the united states gets its way and you know absolutely obliterate the quality of life of whoever is on the ground the children the women the men all of them but they don't care and then you know they they take these women who are in a really bad position yes and they point to them and they say look how they're suffering you know what we should do we should like we should do more to the country. We should countries. bomb them. <laughs> yeah. Like that's literally what they say. They we should really bomb them, and we should send in like our our troops who have a pretty bad record when it comes to women in terms of how they act on the ground. So, yeah, it's just really wild. And like I, I feel like in 2024 we got to be done with hearing any of that. Like I don't want to hear anything about how the United States is interested in you know the <laughs> well being of women internationally. Like I don't buy it. Right. Nobody should buy this anymore. Right. It's like to go back to the point you made it's like the u.s doesn't want to see anyone exercise sovereignty over their own land their own future their own being you yeah. know across the world and i think we also really need to talk about haiti right now because alongside the genocide the occupation that's taking place in palestine funded by the u.s led led by israel there's an a looming occupation in haiti again and I think that that history that y'all are kind of speaking to is important because, you know, Haiti is in a very unstable place politically, economically, um, infrastructurally, whatever the term is, um, because of the centuries of imperialism and occupation led by the United States have ravaged on the country. And so I think the UN put out this this report. The UN loves to put out reports, right? Like I think uh, at the end of 2022, talking about how levels of hunger are like crazy. Levels of sexual violence are really high. Much of that is stemming from, there is paramilitary gang activity taking place in, in Haiti um, as a result of past interventions and occupations uh, from the West in Haiti. And now to solve that issue that came from occupation, the U.S. is proposing more occupation. The Marines, the U.S. Marines has a nasty track record mm -hmm. of rape and sexual mm -hmm. abuse of Haitian women and children and like not just women and children, like men and, and boys as well. Yeah, it's just it's disgusting. You know, it's like the U.S. always wants to push this narrative like we're going to save these 
helpless places, these people who can't seem to get it right, they can't help themselves, um, we're going to liberate these women. And in fact, they just make it worse every single time. The, the sexual violence uh, against colonized women, uh, that's really, really common. And sometimes it's like systematized. I'm thinking of Korea when the U.S. really took advantage of women's economic position there. Like they took advantage of really poor women and they set up these military camp towns on the U.S. military bases. And they basically like econo economically coerced these women, Korean women, into prostitution, into mm. serving U.S. soldiers. Mm -hmm. So not only did the U.S. like completely bomb the shit out of Korea, but they created this system, this prostitution system, this sex trade industry. It was to the point where the South Korean government like actively encouraged it and they created this campaign around it like saying that, you know, it was Korean women's patriotic duty mm -hmm. to oh. basically like go into the sex trade industry and serve US GIs. And that's how a lot of Korean women ended up uh, marrying servicemen and like mm being removed from their families, coming to the States, knowing no one, mm -hmm. and often being victims of domestic violence and being separated from their families. And this sex industry, it basically rebuilt the post-war economy in Korea. But even, even so, their labor was not recognized by the government mm. because it was, even though they actively encouraged it, it was still a taboo subject. Right. And not only that, but there was also this like transnational adoption industry that emerged mm. out of the Korean War. Mm. So uh, hundreds of thousands of children, transnational adoption was not a thing before the Korean War, before the U.S. Oh, occupation. Okay. Interesting, I did not know that. Yeah, and so mm. the U.S., they came in and like basically killed these children's families and then oh, wow. sent them to orphanages and then brought them back to the States to be adopted. So not only did they kill these children's families, but they presented this adoption thing as a humanitarian endeavor, <laughs> which allowed for them to present themselves as like the saviors in this situation. So yeah, the US is always like doing that kind of bullshit and they always present war as like some sort of progressive force that helps women. So yeah, it's just like total bullshit. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that, like, every person needs to internalize at this point is that the United States actually is truly, like, amoral is not a strong enough word, but I think it captures it in that it literally does not care about, like, how human beings are impacted. The, the United States is driven to dominate the world, to, you know, secure resources, to secure hegemony and dominance of, of every region, actually, Talk about of it. every region. And it doesn't matter who's caught up in the crossfire. You know, it's the same thing about when we look here at our own country. Like, I, I mean, it should ring true for all of us because the, our government does not actually care about us either. Like, it, we can go outside right now and walk, like, halfway down the block and find people who are passed out on the street. Right. Like, who you literally don't know if they're alive or dead. That's not an accident. It's not like people don't know that's happening. Mm -hmm. It's not like people don't, uh, you know, who are in power in this country don't understand that women are suffering. That, like, there are so many women who are forced to stay in abusive situations because they don't have economic autonomy. Right. Like, they don't know that teachers can't afford to live in their own cities anymore and that, like, our schools are crumbling. It's not like these are secret. It's just not interesting to, you know, the ruling powers. I guess... To me, that's like the theme that we got to be driving this Women's Month, this Women's Day, every freaking month and day. Like if you care about women and, mm -hmm. you know, the first woman that I really cared about was my mom. I want her to be able to have autonomy and that can't happen if she can't stand on her own economically. Like that was a big right. thing that like was a realization for me is like what what about my life was determined by like my mom's own ability to right make decisions freely you can't really care about the women around you the women around the world any person without actually taking up these questions of like why are so many people suffering who is the culprit and like how do we change that and to me living in the united states the answer there is fortunately really clear like the people oppressing us the people oppressing all of the women that we're watching the people oppressing the women in palestine like it's all it's all the same enemy. It's right here. That's what my mission is, is to fight that. Right. So I was talking to my mom the other day 
Um, my mom is coming up on 65, and so she should be at retirement age. She's been working her ass off her whole life with not that much to show for it, right? Mm. And we're seeing simultaneously, just, I mean, as a separate thing, we're seeing a massive influx of people migrating to the United States, especially to the East Coast. There's all this fear mongering around people immigrating to the United States, you know, like all the typical propaganda, whatever, like they're going to take your jobs, like they're taking uh, federal resources or whatever. Really, people are often migrating to the United States because the United States fucked up their country <laughs> and they are forced to find other opportunities in the United States. But I was talking to her because I think it's very easy for people to look around and try to point the blame for their issues on someone, whether it's someone who looks different from them, whether it's whatever CNN is blabbering about, you know, XYZ group of people. But really, we have so much more to gain when we recognize that we actually are being uh, repressed as women and just working class people in general by the same enemy. Like it's people around the globe, women around the globe who are facing struggles that we have more in common with than these women like Kamala Harris or Hillary Clinton or whoever else, you name it, any of these women who are our so-called leaders mm -hmm. who do nothing for us. Like, it's really, like, pathetic, you know? It's it's truly pathetic, and you're exactly right that it's, it's set up to be that way. It's no mistake that that's how structurally capitalism is, is run, and I think it's really important for this Women's History Month and every Women's History Month, every month of the year, to recognize that, you know, things might be not that great for us right now, but we need to turn and realize who our, our real enemy is so that we can, you know, be able to join together and, and fight against that, in my opinion. Yeah, I think <laughs> the genocide in Gaza, like just seeing it as a feminist issue, you really are able to see through a lot of these feminist icons that you were talking about, like these women in government that are presented to us that we should admire. Um, the genocide in Gaza has really like laid bare the superficialness of their feminism, right? I'm thinking of Kirsten Gillibrand, who is a senator from New York, and she is the picture perfect illustration of bourgeois feminist. You have this like white woman who managed to kind of elevate herself into a Senate position. She calls herself a women's advocate and a feminist. She is backed by Wall Street. She's fundraised for Wall Street. She was a corporate lawyer. Um, I think she's also married to a venture capitalist. But oh, what great. Has, she got the whole package going on, I guess. Yeah, just like picture perfect illustration of bourgeois feminism. But what has she said about the genocide in Gaza? Like pretty much nothing. Probably she nothing. like yeah. has <laughs> not called for a ceasefire and mm. she has failed to call for a ceasefire despite her constituents demanding it of her. Right. She was speaking at a Brooklyn town hall in Brooklyn Heights a couple of weeks ago and we organized a disruption of the town hall. And so there were like almost a dozen of us just like set up and, you know, disrupted her throughout her speech. But one of the talking points of one of the disruptors was the fact that she called herself an advocate for women, mm -hmm. that she called herself a feminist, mm -hmm. but she had nothing to say about the horrific conditions uh, of women in Gaza right now. The fact that women in Gaza are giving birth without proper medical equipment, mm. oh. without anesthesia, mm. that like women are getting their periods in Gaza, but they don't know where and when they can like shower next. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. The fact yeah. that, you know, like, that there's, like, not really any sort of medical care available. Mm -hmm. So we, like, threw that back at her. We asked her what she had to say. That was, like, one of the disruptor's points. And she, like, really didn't address us. She basically fled the town hall. Not surprising. Yeah. No, I love that, look, being a woman is not enough protection these days. Like, if you can be a woman and we're still going to come for you if you're standing with genocide, like, that doesn't make you... A friend of women, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Hillary Clinton, Kristen Gillibrand, uh, Jill Biden, Ugh. Nikki Haley, Ugh. all these. Wow, you uh, just chose all the absolute worst yeah, ones Kamala, to name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're coming for all of them. Honestly, like, 
if you're a woman who's against all the other women that like then right. what does that mean to us nothing and i i actually think like it's really amazing to be part of like you know seeing a movement that's bringing so many young people and so many women like into action mm -hmm. and i feel like i've never seen so many truly like militant politically clear and firm people out there starting to actually organize and and honestly like come into themselves which i'm sorry that that's feminism right there mm -hmm. like you know finding yourself and your voice and and not being fooled and like actually you know knowing what you stand on and it's beautiful to see here in new york like we've been seeing how hard that's been resisted and, and it's been absolutely really moving to see and to be part of uh, what is truly a woman-led mm -hmm. movement I know that's that is right. fearless that is actually embodying like what an empowered woman is and will come for all those ruling class women who are bombing starving you know women in gaza and abandoning all the women here okay period mm -hmm. i think especially after the 9 11 attacks and the invasion of iraq and afghanistan I think a lot of women and uh, feminists here are really starting to see clearly the way that the U.S. government uses war and occupation as a progressive force, like try mm -hmm. to paint it as a progressive force. Uh, right? yeah. it, historically, they've always done this, right? The French occupation of Algeria was seen as a progressive force. Like during the uh, War for National Liberation, how the French responded to that was that like, they would like put together like these mass unveiling ceremonies that were public where the wives of French soldiers would unveil an Algerian woman, like lift the uh, veil. And it was like oh, a public no, baby. thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it was seen as a sign of solidarity between oh my like, the Algerian women and their French sisters. It was really, it was really, really sick. And on top of that, they would hire French photographers to hire Algerian women uh, to pose for them. And in, the, in these photographs, uh, the women, would, they'd be made to like unveil themselves and often undress. And the photographers would take pictures of them. And so this was a tactic of psychological warfare, right? It was sexual humiliation of the women. But at the same time, uh, the photos were used as war propaganda. Um, they would be sold throughout mm. Europe. The photos would be uh, printed onto postcards and sold throughout Europe. Um, and it was a way of justifying the occupation, like saying that, you know, Algerian women, because of the French occupation, now they're not uh, restricted by face coverings, they're sexually liberated like French women. It presented the French occupation as bringing Algeria into, mo into modernity, like bringing the colonized mm. into modernity. This like idea that war can bring women's liberation, can bring women's rights. It's this really old kind of rhetoric that has been around for a long time. But I think women and feminists see how it's being used in Gaza and they're like actively resisting it. They no longer really believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't know how much more stark it has to get. Like when you see a country that is literally made unlivable, you know, where, I mean, as we're seeing in Gaza, the people have been driven further and further and further south, told that that's the only way that you'll be allowed to survive. You know, you have to leave your homes, you have to pick up your family. You're still getting bombed the whole way through. Then they concentrate everyone in Rafa, and now you know we're on the verge of a of a ground invasion of Rafa and the total obliteration of like this hyper concentrated people who have been under siege. Which I hope everybody in this country now understands. Like the siege didn't start October seventh. Mm. October seventh was a response. As people are seeing the absolute d decimation of quality of life of any ability, like. If you're a feminist and you want to see women go to school, you want to see women choose their own careers, you want to see women like find themselves, how the hell are you going to do that in a country where you, you, life is barely even possible, where survival mm -hmm. is like the only thing that you can focus on? Mm -hmm. How anyone can look at that and believe that this like that has anything to do with caring about women, it's it's unbelievable to me. Like if you care about women, you should be fighting. You, you should be with the people who are resisting that, who are in large part women 
And, you know, it's just stunning to me that these lies have, have stood up for so long, but I really hope and am c- encouraged by, like, the movement that we're seeing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that we're part of every day now uh, that's bringing so many people into a greater understanding. I think we, we have to be having these types of conversations that are, like, pushing people to, to not go back, like, to view that it's not just a one-off thing that's happening in Palestine that's so horrific to watch, but this is, like, systematically how the United States views women, views humanity, here, abroad, everywhere, like, you can bet on it. If you're for women, you're against the U.S. empire. Period. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I mean, I think fortunately, we uh, have left that period definitively. People aren't buying into that anymore. Uh, You know, you look at the movement now, and like, you know, we were out on Women's Day this month. I think there are people out all over the country who were actually saying, okay, this Women's Day, we're going to, we're going to fight genocide. We're going to fight the siege on Gaza. I think that it's going to be a lot harder progressively for the United States to sell wars to us on the basis of like any kind of progressive argument that this is humanitarian. Mm -hmm. I think consciousness is actually shifting in this country. And that's like really the, the most hopeful thing that we have Mm -hmm. right now because it's like it's a bleak period i mean it's really the horrors that are happening are are like pretty staggering what we have to do with that Mm -hmm. is to be struggling with the people who are seeing it and actually making it a time that we're fighting and we're we're actually shifting consciousness in a way that's going to last in some ways like they're making it easy for us like on women's day you had the nypd come out in the most i mean we've been dealing with repression from them uh, for the last, you know, five plus months. And on Women's Day, we had the most violent exchanges with the NYPD yet, where they were literally yanking women, taking them by the kafia and throwing them to the ground, pulling wow. women off of the sidewalk, like arresting them brutally. These were, you know, both lead organizers, but then also just like women who were in the protests. And, you know, not just women, like indiscriminate, right? But mm-hmm. like how much more naked does it get than you have like people who are out saying, you know, we stand against genocide. We are protesting peacefully, as is ostensibly our right, um, right. to say that the government that speaks in our name, yeah, we, we don't stand with uh, you using our funds and, you know, providing political cover for uh, a genocide. Mm-hmm. And the way that they're met is with just brutality. If you're going to pull a thread of hope out of any of this, it's that, like, People are really paying attention, and I think it's going to be a lot harder to get away with, you know, fooling people into supporting, you know, more imperialist wars on on a progressive basis. I mean, I think what you're saying is really important because, as you mentioned, we are literally watching this unfold before our eyes in the most disgusting way. And I think it's very easy to lose hope, to just curl up into a ball and be like, damn, like... These are some nasty, horrible atrocities that are happening. But I really encourage people to channel that emotion into action. Because for myself, I find I there were so many years where I found myself so angry, just like like seeing everything around me mm-hmm. in shambles. And maybe I didn't have the exact words for it. Now I feel like I do more so. And I'm able... It, it feels so empowering to be like, yeah, I'm freaking angry and I'm going to organize and be in the streets chanting with my comrades, with my community and saying hell no to all of this. Mm-hmm. Like we need and deserve something better. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a lot of hope in seeing how many young people, how many people intergenerationally as well um, all around the world are standing out and saying you know, we, we need and, and deserve something better. And, you know, women lead and run our communities. You know, they women are making shit happen. They make things run. And it's going to be no different in the fight for, you know, the society that we want to see. You know, women hold up half the sky. We have nothing to lose but our chains, literally. And women are going to continue to lead on the front and... We need more people to join us. I think that if people are feeling like I can't tolerate what I'm seeing on my phone, I can't tolerate what I see around me, then like you got to decide to become a factor in it, Mm -hmm. become a factor in, you know, what happens next. 
it's undeniable now that all of the people who have taken action in this country and around the world have become a factor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we were to sit back and do nothing, believe me, the outcome, the question of a ceasefire, the question of what happens in Palestine would be a lot more straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have a duty to the women and the people who are, you know, we see suffering around the world as well as, you know, in our own homes. And, uh, and to ourselves. And to ourselves. And to ourselves. Become a factor. That's the most human thing you can do. It's the most feminist thing you can do. Right. Become a factor. Okay. So with that, there's so much we could talk about. We want to continue having these conversations because these are real issues happening in our communities and we're invested in them, right? But like Lillian said, become a factor, get involved, join the PSL, and we'll see you out in the streets.